Yeah, that's, uh, that's hard. Um, I'm going to get started because I'm sure people would rather hear more of your talk rather than um, the introduction. So I'm going to get started with the usual introduction. So welcome to the University of Connecticut's Brain Imaging Research Center, or BERC's speaker series. I'm the host, Fumiko Heft, director of BERC and professor of psychological sciences, mathematics, neuroscience, and psychiatry. Over the past two years, we've hosted a number of speakers. As you can see here, many of the recordings are available on our website, so please check them out. We've had about 25 hundred people joining our series from over 130 institutions all over the world. Thank you so much for helping us make this event so successful. Please do let your friends and colleagues know about this series because we'll continue next year as well and they can get updates by emailing Lizzie who's listed on this uh, slide. Elizabeth.colin at uconn.edu. Um, so some housekeeping items that you probably all know by now. You will be muted and we usually try unmuting or clapping before and after the talk as we feel like it's always nice to have this um, personal touch and you feel like you're talking to someone and someone was listening to you. Um, even though I tend to fail doing this effectively, but we will try. I think I'm getting a little bit better each time. If you do have questions, please put it in the chat box. And if it's urgent, if you don't mind putting the um, in caps and starting with urgent, then we will try to put it in the middle of in between his slides or sections so we can get that answered quicker. But if not, we might wait until the end. But we'll, so we'll take most questions at the end. So let's get started. Today is my greatest pleasure to introduce the last speaker of 2020, Professor Ko Murayama, a newly minted Alexander von Humboldt professor from the University of Tübingen. He, he's received his PhD from University of Tokyo in 2006. And uh, just for those who don't know, the Humboldt Professorship is an exceptionally prestigious and the most highly endowed research award in Germany. And it was established 11 years ago to draw top international researchers like Ko to German universities. And it seems like it's been very successful. Ko is a psychologist whose major focus is on the theory and mechanism underlying human motivation. He has a broad and interdisciplinary background, both in basic and applied, especially educational sciences. And his research program takes a multi method approach, combining a number of different perspectives and methodologies such as longitudinal modeling, behavior experiments, neuroimaging, and educational intervention. One of the central themes of his recent work is to understand how humans are autonomously motivated to seek and gain knowledge, where the motivational state is often called interest or intrinsic motivation, and how we can apply this idea to educational settings. I remember in one of the original communications with Ko now almost 10 years ago, we were just looking back at how we originally met. And we were reading his PNAS paper from I think around 2010, and he happened to be in town. So we got to invite him to our lab back then at UCSF, and he gave a wonderful talk. I asked for his slides, and um, I give a lot of talks to educators and the community, and I often modify and give a whole talk almost on Ko's um, past work, and it's one of my most popular talks that I give to the uh, community. When you study his CV, what stands out is not only the breadth and depth of his high impact research and incisive kind of study designs, but also how prolific he was from the beginning of his career. Not that the number of paper matters, but he had 12 first author publications by the time he received his PhD. Um, and what's even more remarkable is the high quality of these papers from early on. I continue to cite his papers in many of my talks, as I just said, and I can give a whole hour of talk for it, just piecing together his work, which is quite amazing. Um, and his research is very accessible, not only to academics, but also to educators and the community. And uh, what's also remarkable is the number of awards he has received in the relatively short career, which speaks to the respect that the community has for his work, which includes awards from the American Psychological Foundation, International Mind, Brain, and Education Society, American Psychological Association, Jacobs Foundation, and this most recent award from the Humboldt Foundation. Um, and so with this, please join me in welcoming Professor uh, Ko Murayama. I'm going to unmute everyone. I'm not very good at this, but let me try. All right. 
It's slow. I think slowly it being unmuted. Is everyone being unmuted? Is it unmuted, Lizzie? It doesn't look like that on my computer. It yes, is. it is. So okay. we, have to, we have to unmute it ourselves. <laughs> All right, I'm going to mute back everyone so we can hear starting to talk. I can't, my computer is. Okay, now just uh, Fumiko and Ko need to unmute themselves. I unmuted you, Ko. Okay, mm -hmm. you're ready to go. Sorry, it's still sluggish yeah. after a, mm -hmm. a year of practicing, but go ahead. Thank you very much, okay. Ko. Thank you. I must share my screen. So can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much for the kind of introduction of Miko Sensei. Um, my name is Ko Murayama from the University of Tübingen in Germany. And um, today I'm going to talk about my recent work about curiosity and interest. The title is A Real Learning Framework of Autonomous Knowledge Acquisition. So this talk is about interest or curiosity. Interest or curiosity constitutes an integral aspect of human functioning and supports an enormous variety of human behaviors, ranging from early learning in children to scientific discovery. One remarkable feature of curiosity or interest is that it motivates people in the absence of explicit extrinsic incentives, such as money, price, social recognition, and so on. For example, think about Albert Einstein. He made an extraordinary achievement, but his achievement cannot be fully explained by the extrinsic incentives only. He was genuinely motivated to understand the truth of the world, and he was able to sustain his engagement without relying on extrinsic incentives. How is that possible? That has been a question that I have been working on recently. So how can we sustain our motivation without extrinsic incentives? When you look into the literature, there are indeed many studies about interest, curiosity, and intrinsic motivation. And many studies show that interest is associated with many real life outcomes. So if you have high interest, that would be a good thing for you. And many studies showed antecedents of interest as well. However, precise psychological mechanisms underlying interest and curiosity is still underdeveloped. In my reading of the literature, there has been two critical issues that makes it quite difficult to actually understand the underlying mechanisms of curiosity and interest. The first issue is that there are two contradictory meta theories of interest, which I, yeah. And in the field of psychology, for example, interest is something special, interest is regarded something special which is qualitatively different from the motivation driven by extrinsic incentives, such as food. Indeed, some empirical studies show that interest or intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation are associated with different outcomes. Some researchers even argue that they are even competitive, um, which is actually reflected in the undermining effect that I'm going to talk about later. On the other hand, in the literature of neuroscience and cognitive science, interest is framed in a completely different manner. That is, interest is considered as little different from extrinsic incentives. This is based on the empirical finding showing that interest and extrinsic motivation activate the common bearing areas, which is called the brain, real network in the brain. And based on these findings, researchers in cognitive science and neuroscience tend to argue that interest and extrinsic incentives work in a similar manner in a human mind, so you don't need to make a strong distinction between them. Another critical issue in the literature is that there are different research transitions on the similar topic. You may find it funny, but actually there's a line of research called curiosity, and there's a separate line of research called interest. Obviously, curiosity and interest are related to each other. You may find them almost the same. However, these two lines of research are completely different. Research on curiosity 
is basically uh, in research curiosity, empirical research tend to focus on short-term information seeking or information search behavior in simplified settings. And this design is predominant in the field of cognitive science and neuroscience. And the quantitative theories are predominant in the field. On the other hand, research on interest is predominated in the field of education and some applied psychology areas. In this, in this research area, empirical research tends to focus on long-term development with real-life materials, such as education materials and texts. And there are many theories, but these theories are qualitative and sometimes quite diverse. There's yet another line of research about curiosity and interest. This line of research is about trait curiosity and trait interest. As you can see from the name, this is more about the personality traits about curiosity and interest. And the empirical research tends to focus on individual differences with survey questions. And in this area, theories are mainly concerned with the typology of different personality traits about curiosity and interest. Importantly, little communication has been made between these different research traditions, uh, making it quite difficult to have an integrated perspective of how interest develops or how interest works in human mind. The purpose of this presentation is to present a kind of broad and a preliminary conceptual framework to understand interest and curiosity. I want to emphasize that this is a preliminary, so I'm open to any critical comments or questions about the framework. Um, but the aim is to integrate these two seemingly contradictory meta theories of interest and curiosity, and also to link different research traditions of interest and curiosity. The idea, the framework is called the real learning framework of autonomous knowledge acquisition. The idea is quite simple. Interest or curiosity involves internally generated rewarding processes in knowledge acquisition when extrinsic incentives are not available. Extrinsic incentives play an important role to shape our behavior, but extrinsic incentives are not always available, especially in higher order activities, such as reasoning and creativity. In the evolutionary process, humans and other higher organisms acquire the ability to self generate rewards from knowledge acquisition itself to sustain or boost their behavior when extrinsic incentives are not available. And this is what we naively call interest or curiosity. More specifically, the framework basically argues that interest can be portrayed as a reward learning of knowledge acquisition. And that's why there's a similarity between interest and the extrinsic incentives. But at the same time, it also stipulates that reward learning of knowledge acquisition involves some unique features that makes interest distinct from extrinsic rewards. So this framework tries to explain both similarities and differences between interest and extrinsic incentives. So let me go through these points one by one. The first point is interest can be portrayed as reward learning of knowledge acquisition. This is a very standard reward learning or reinforcement learning framework based on extrinsic incentives. When there's a condition stimuli and when an organism makes an action, then the organism might receive a reward, such as food. This reward would give the organism rewarding experience, which would strengthen the likelihood of the action being made when the conditioned stimuli is presented again next time. This is a very standard schematic picture of how conditioning works, and you should have already learned this basic picture in your basic psychology class. Recent new imaging studies uh, repeatedly found that this process is actually associated and related to the so-called neural network in the brain, such as stratum. The framework posits that the same picture should apply to the information seeking behavior or knowledge acquisition behavior. That is, when people feel knowledge gap, well, when people feel novelty about something, then people might make an information-seeking behavior and people might get knowledge uh, 
out of this information seeking behavior. Importantly, this framework in suggests that knowledge acquisition actually works as an internal rewards, giving rewarding experience to people, which would increase the likelihood of information seeking behavior being made next time when they have the same knowledge gap. In other words, knowledge acquisition or interest and exchange incentives work in a similar way to regulate behavior. There are indeed many studies showing that information seeking behavior, curiosity, or interest are based on reward learning. For example, this is one of the seminar work about seminar new imaging work about curiosity uh, by Kang. In this study, participants are presented with trivia questions and they investigated the neural correlates underlying the curiosity triggered by trivia questions. And they found that the stratum actually is actually the one of the important area that is associated with curiosity. It's not about trivia questions. Using many different paradigms, people repeatedly found that interest, curiosity, intrinsic motivation is associated with activation in the stratum or as a real network in the brain. There are also some studies showing that real network is related to memory consolidation especially, and um, this has been demonstrated using extrinsic incentives. And recent study also shows that this schematic picture also applies to curiosity-driven learning. That is, when you are curious about something, your learning would be boosted or enhanced. And this is also related to the reward network activation in the brain. This idea is not new at all. Indeed, when you look at the literature of cognitive science, uh, robotics or artificial intelligence computational modeling, you can find many different versions of models that tries to explain curiosity-based behavior, and many models adapted this dual learning framework. Many models are different in many different ways, but basically they are trying to figure out uh, which kind of information is more rewarding than others. By formulating that knowledge acquisition behavior is based on your learning, we can also make an interesting prediction. For example, uh, your learning based on extrinsic incentive is aimed to optimize the behavior by maximizing reward. But in reality, this does not work very well because in some cases, reward, rewarding experiences are so strong that people are actually motivated to take an irrational, impulsive behavior. One good example is drug addiction. Everyone knows that it's not a good idea to take drugs, but for some people, it's quite difficult to resist, it, to resist to the temptation of the drugs because the rewarding experience associated with taking the drug is so strong. That is, sometimes reward has incentive salience property, which makes people take an irrational, impulsive behavior. If curiosity-based self-regulation is based on the dual learning, then a similar phenomena should be observed uh, based on the curiosity-based behavior. That is, rewarding experiences associated with knowledge acquisition may be so strong that people sometimes take an irrational, impulsive behavior to satisfy their curiosity or interest. Actually, it's not that difficult to find that example uh, in other stories or anecdotes. For example, think about the uh, Greek mythology, Orpheus. Eurydice and Orpheus are husband and a wife, but Eurydice passed away. Orpheus got devastated so much that he decided to go underground and negotiated with the Hades there, and remarkably, he successfully negotiated with the Hades and got the Eurydice back. But when he went to, in his, on his way back to the overground, he was told that he should not look back. He must not look back. So he knew the danger of looking back. However, he succumbed to the temptation to look back. And as a result, he lost Eurydice. This theme is repeated in many different types of mythologies, such as Pandora or Ape, 
And I was wondering what, you know, I was wondering about the way to replicate this situation inside the fMRI scanner. And we recently conducted an um, fMRI study to replicate this kind of situation within the fMRI. One key question or one key challenge of this fMRI experiment was to induce a trigger curiosity inside the fMRI scanner. In the fMRI scanner, it's dark and noisy, so it's quite difficult to actually trigger a strong curiosity. And after a long discussion, uh, we decided to use mask tricks inside the fMRI scanner. In this experiment, there are two conditions, curiosity condition and food condition. In the food condition, participants are presented with food pictures. Participants are asked not to eat before the experiment. So this would actually increase their motivation to eat food. In the curiosity condition, participants are presented with video clips of magic tricks. And for that purpose, we actually invited professional magicians to our lab and videotaped more than 100 video clips. And I'm going to show you two of them. He was a world champion of a magic trick, a magic uh, competition. I hope you are able to see the video clip uh, even with an online environment. Yep. Um, then let me show you next one. This magician is actually a psychologist and one of the authors of the paper. I hope this triggered your curiosity a little bit. <laughs> and in this FMI experiment, after presenting these materials, participants are asked to make a decision of whether they would like to take a lottery or not. If they decided to take the lottery, there's a good chance for them to know the solution behind the magic tricks, which they just seen. But the danger is that when they decided to take the lottery but lost, then they needed to take electric shock. Yeah. So there's a risk associated with this decision making. And in the food condition, the station is the same. If they decided to take the lottery and they win, then they can get the food after the experiment. But if they decided to take the lottery and if they lost, then they were going to receive an electric shock. And it turned out that Participants are quite actually happy to take the risk of receiving electric shock to satisfy their curiosity and food uh, to satisfy their hunger. In fact, uh, for both conditions, quite a few participants in quite a few trials, participants were happy to take the risk of receiving electric shock. But what is more interesting is that when we look at the brain activation underlying this decision making behavior, the whole network is related to the decision of accepting electric shocks for both magic trick and food conditions, indicating that this decision making is actually governed by the common uh, shared uh, neural system. So this is consistent with the idea that both curiosity and extrinsic incentives are based on reward learning. My another postdoc lady recently also conducted an interesting behavioral study to show how tempting curiosity would be. In this experiment, part, uh, participants took a balloon analog risk task, which is a very popular paradigm in psychology decision making. In this task, participants, participants had to make a decision on how many pumps they would like to make to inflate a balloon. And the more uh, pumps they made, the more points they can get and the more money they can get. But if they pumped too much, then the balloon would burst and they, cannot, they couldn't get any points. So this is a very common risky decision-making task. But we added a tweak to this paradigm. That is, after seeing the outcome, we actually told participants that 
they could see the limit of the balloon of the previous trial if they pay a cost. That is, if they paid money or they made an effort or if they waited a little bit longer, then they can see the limit of the balloon of the previous trial. Importantly, all the trials are independent from each other, so knowing the limit of the current trial would not improve, improve their performance in the next trial. But by seeing the limit, they can also understand how much they could have pumped in the case of winning trial. We found that even if they had to pay a cost, in more than 40% of the trials, they opted to see the limit. This also indicates a power of curiosity to satisfy our power of curiosity. But what is more interesting to us is that we also found that after seeing the limit, people generally felt negative about uh, the outcome. This indicates that people are so curious such that they even incur cost to expense regret, that is negative emotions. This is also another example of how curiosity can be tempting and even if they knew that this would cause a negative outcome. Let me talk about the next topic. So I have been talking about the similarity between curiosity and extrinsic incentives. And there are actually many people who discuss that way, but I also wanted to focus or highlight the differences between reward and curiosity within the same reward learning framework. That is, reward learning of knowledge acquisition involves unique features that make interest distinct from extrinsic rewards. And I summarize, I, I make this point by pointing out four different aspects. The first one is um, cumulativeness. Again, this is a standard reinforcing learning model with extrinsic incentives. One common uh, one important aspect of this uh, standard reward learning is that once exchange reward is supplied, then agent or organism would normally consume it. And as a result, uh, it's typically gone. And after eating a lot of food, sometimes the organism is satiated. This means that to sustain the regulation based on this framework, you need a constant supply of exchange reward. What about knowledge acquisition curiosity? Again, the same thing applies, but there's a critical difference here. That is, here, the outcome is not a tangible reward. The outcome is knowledge acquisition. Why does that make a difference? Once you get the knowledge, it should be integrated into your existing knowledge, which I call knowledge base or self scheme. And this would make a big difference in terms of the sustainability of the system. There are three different ways uh, for this uh, scheme to make a system sustainable. First, once you get the new knowledge, this would typically produce more room for more questions and which would prompt further information seeking behavior. For example, when you think about learning statistics, you learn a new technique such as multiplication analysis. After learning it, of course, you increase your knowledge, but at the same time, this new knowledge actually generates a lot of different questions about the things that you just learned. When you learn multiplication analysis, of course, you have a good knowledge about multi multiplication analysis, uh, but at the same time, this would you know, make you wonder many different things. For example, uh, how is it different from partial correlation analysis? How does it tell causality? If you are a good learner, it's quite natural for you to have this kind of question. Another thing is that once you get the knowledge, this would also increase the value of the knowledge or decrease the value of knowledge. Again, uh, think about the statistics. Many psychology students don't like statistics in the first place. But once they learn how psychology is studied in academia, people tend to understand the importance of statistics, studying statistics, and this would actually increase the value of acquiring knowledge about statistics. The last important thing is the capability. Information seeking behavior needs some capability. For example, if we want to understand very difficult physics principles, you need to understand the basics of physics. That is, to understand, to make information seeking more successful, you, you need to have some capability. And this capability is also supported by the knowledge base. 
So by acquiring more knowledge, you can increase your capability, which increases the likelihood of information seeking behavior being more successful. What are the implications of these processes? In short, this would actually make the system more sustainable. That is, this would create a positive feedback loop that self boosts rewarding experience over time. And once you establish the process, you can increasingly self generate the rewarding feeling. This sustain commitment to the knowledge acquisition process without extrinsic rewards. In other words, interest based self regulation is more sustainable than self regulation based on extrinsic incentives. This feature is critically different from the self regulation of extrinsic incentives again. Of course, this is a big picture, so it's not easy to make, a, you know, to demonstrate the point empirically, but there's, there are a few potential predictions. For example, one potential prediction is that a first few doses of interest could make a big long-term difference due to the self-boosting effect. That is, initial differences in interest would become larger over time, creating a bigger gap between those who are initially interested and those who are not. Once this system is activated, then you can self boost your interest and you can increase the interest over time. But if this system does not start up, then you cannot increase the interest for a particular topic. As a result, uh, there's a big gap between those who are interested and those who are not interested in the first place. This is sometimes called snowball effect, a master effect, but I, uh, we can apply this idea to the context of interest. When I came up with the idea, of course, I didn't do any empirical research, but when I looked back my work, actually there are some suggestions, again, so this is not a direct evidence, but there are some suggestions uh, indicating that this idea might be correct. For example, this is a study that I conducted like seven years ago. Uh, we use a longitudinal survey to examine uh, the growth of students' math achievement over years. The x-axis represents uh, participants' grade or years, and y-axis represents represent participants' math achievement scores. Here, the solid line represents students with high initial intuition motivation for mathematics, and dotted line represents students with low initial intuition motivation for mathematics. As you can see, at the beginning of the assessment, those two types of students do not make a difference in terms of math achievement. But what was interesting is that this difference gets larger and larger over time, indicating that, indicating that interest actually is related to the interest for mathematics has a kind of accumulative effect on learning. Again, when I conducted this study, I, was not having, I didn't have an idea that I just presented, but this is somewhat consistent with the idea that I got recent years. I think I should skip this one because of the time, but I also did an aging study about the curiosity and the interest. And you, again, when I conducted this aging study, I didn't actually have an idea of how we could explain this phenomenon. But in, a hi um, in hindsight, um, I can explain this phenomenon based on the snowball effect, the math effect of interest. But I'm going to skip this slide. I also, found data set that could potentially demonstrate the idea uh, which uh, so this is a the analysis of the data uh, we used uh, we published uh, like seven years ago in this study we assessed students interest for a university class over 10 or 11 weeks and we assess students interest every week then we can actually draw a growth curve of interest of students over 10 or 11 weeks. And we plotted it uh, depending on the initial interest of students. What we found is that uh, the difference between uh, students with high initial interest and students with low initial interest gets larger over time, indicating that initial difference is actually accentuated as uh, they learn more materials. This phenomenon is quite interesting for me because according to the relation to the mean effect, actually this gap should be actually 
smaller as time progresses, but the actual state of the data is different. My first PhD student grader also conducted a, came up with an interesting design that can test this idea. In this experiment, uh, she presented many pieces of facts about lesser known countries such as East Timor. Importantly, participants are presented with a piece of fact one by one, and after learning each piece of fact, they also indicated the interest about the country. This way, we can examine how the accumulation of knowledge or facts or information would influence the change of interest over time. And this is the finding that we got. As you can see, the more amount, the more information participants acquired, the more interest they developed for the country. So this is also consistent with the idea that rewarding feeling would accumulate over time. And what is more interesting is that the difference between the countries with high initial interest and countries with low initial interest got larger as the amount of information get larger, indicating that there's a kind of snowball effect here. Let me talk about the second point, selectivity. So I've been talking about interest snowball effect. And I'm also going to talk about some implications of this interest snowball effect a little bit more. I think this interest snowball effect can also speak to some one big mystery of interest, that is large individual differences. Everyone knows that there's a huge individual differences in interest. For example, some students like mathematics, but some other students like music or dance, there's a huge individual differences here. But no one actually addressed why there are such huge individual differences in terms of the preference that they formed. Interest snowball effect could give a clue uh, to answer this big question. That is, snowball effect serves as an inherent mechanism that selectively bolsters particular areas of interest. More specifically, initial individual differences may be very minor, and it may be just caused by uh, random factors. But due to the snowball effect, uh, through the developmental process, they end up with much larger individual differences. It's also worth noting that humans are basically or generally designed to really enforce our preferences. When we are asked to you know, explain why we like something, we are extremely good at explaining or justifying our preference. When I'm asked why I like statistics, I can tell a lot of stories about this for more than an hour. And of course, some of these stories may be true, but most of these stories are based on their you know, inherent, um, most of these stories are also motivated by their you know, motivation to make a coherent story to satisfy the current status of knowledge. This mechanism can explain why we have large individual differences in the topics we are interested in. Even if there are, minor, even if there are only minor differences uh, at the beginning, and um, even if the initial condition is similar at the beginning, some random factors could lead to completely different trajectories of interest development over time. And as a result, now we have large individual differences of interest. Indeed, we recently conducted some quantification of individual differences of curiosity and interest, applying some psychometric analysis, and we found that indeed curiosity and interest uh, has a large individual differences component. For example, using trivia questions, about 45% of the individual difference here, about 45% of the variance of curiosity rating can be explained by individual differences. This general idea could also explain how trait interest or trait curiosity emerge over time. When you look into the literature of personality traits of curiosity and interest, you may be overwhelmed because there are so many different types of curiosity and interest proposed. Many researchers propose different dimensions of curiosity and interest. And actually, it's not difficult to find similar trait, traits with curiosity and interest such as novelty seeking, sensation seeking, and so on. And even in big five personality traits, there are some similar traits with curious interest, 
such as openness to experience and conscientiousness. My intention is not to show which dimension is most fundamental, but I just want to, you know, but this, this idea and the idea that just I described would give us a clue to why there are so many personality traits related to curiosity and interest. More specifically, um, personally, how personality, we, when we think about how personality traits are developed, it's based on the generalization through reinforcement. And because interest and curiosity has an inherent property that would support the self-boosting of reward learning, interest and curiosity have an inherent property of manifest to ma manifest as a major personality dimension. And this is how state, uh, how state curiosity or interest would trans could transform into trait curiosity and interest as well. Let me talk about the third topic, which is about the vulnerability. So far, I have been discussing the possibility that both extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards are based on the common legal learning system. But the regulation both based on intrinsic rewards also have some properties that make the system more sustainable. But the question is, what if both extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards are present? When you think about the nature of these rewards, there are actually some differences. For example, extrinsic rewards are relatively old, uh, through regulation based on extrinsic rewards is relatively old mechanism. And extrinsic rewards are also tangible and salient. On the other hand, the regulation based on intrinsic rewards is a relatively new mechanism. And intrinsic rewards based on knowledge acquisition is also abstract. With these properties, we can reasonably expect that when both incentives are present, or both types of rewards are present, actually extrinsic rewards could suppress the functioning of intrinsic rewards. Indeed, it's not so difficult to find such examples in the classic literature of psychology. For example, uh, there's a phenomenon called insufficient justification, which is described by a classic work by Pesting and Carlsmith. In this classic experiment, participants worked on a very boring task. Uh, in this task, participants had to turn pegs in, peg, in a pegboard for an hour. And they had to move 48 spools of thread a quarter turn in one direction, then another quarter turn, and so on. So it was quite boring. There were two conditions in this experiment. In the first condition, uh, which is called a small reward group, participants received $1 for the participation. In the large reward group, participants received $20 for participation. And the dependent variable is reported interest for the task. What they, what they found is that counterintuitively, participants in the large reward condition showed less interest for the task. There are many explanations about this phenomenon, but one potential explanation based on the schematic picture that I showed earlier is that actually they created interest when monetary rewards are not salient, but this capability of generating internal rewards is blocked when the extrinsic rewards are salient. In other words, they stopped creating interest when monetary rewards are salient. We actually did an experiment, or a fMRI experiment, which investigated the underlying neural correlates of this, under the, um, this insufficient justification. And we also found that reward network is associated with this process. So this is also consistent with the basic idea here. That is, internal rewards are produced when the choice is not explicitly justified by extrinsic rewards. Another example that demonstrated this point is the undermining effect. Undermining effect is a phenomenon in which provision of performance-based extrinsic incentives decreases intrinsic motivation for a task. 
This has been repeatedly demonstrated in the literature and actually compatible with the current idea. That is, if extrinsic incentives are not available, then they can generate internal rewards. But if extrinsic rewards are available, the system does not effectively process internal rewards. That's why extrinsic rewards can decrease intrinsic motivation. And this is a work that Fumiko Sensei talked about in the introduction. Um, it was already 10 years ago. Uh, it's a kind of embarrassing that I'm still talking about this paper, but <laughs> let me explain the study. Uh, in this paper, we investigate the neural correlates with this undermining effect. Uh, participants are randomly assigned to a reward group or control group. Participants in the reward group were, and they played with the game-like task inside the scanner. Importantly, participants in the reward group were promised performance-based payment. On the other hand, participants in the control group were not promised any performance-based payment for working on this task. After this scanning session, participants were left uh, released from the scanner and left alone in a waiting room and asked to wait in the room for the next session. From the participant's perspective, this was, this was just a waiting period. And actually, participants could do whatever they wanted. They could read a magazine in the room if they wanted. They could even take a nap in the room. In the room. But importantly, there's a computer with which they could play with the task they just worked on in the FMI scanner. And the computer secretly recorded how often they played with the task during this waiting period. And we use this as an index of intrinsic motivation. So, <laughs> just a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excuse me. I <laughs> Very sweet. We love special guests. Yeah. So, what the, was I talking about? I was talking about the future spirit. Yes. So, I used uh, how. I examined how often they played with the task during this period. And to examine the brain activation associated with the undermining effect, participants were put in the scanner again and played with the task again. But importantly, in this second session, neither group of participants were promised performance based payment. This is a behavior result. As you can see, participants in the reward group played with a game-like task less frequently than the participants in the control group, indicating that participants' intrinsic motivation for the task was indeed decreased. What was the brain activation during these sessions? In the first session, when participants in the reward group were promised proof-based payment, there was activation in the stratum. Actually, the activation in the stratum was bigger in the reward group participants, indicating that they got more excited, which made sense because they are promised performance based payment. In the second session, control group participants sustained the activation in the stratum, indicating that they still sustained their intrinsic motivation for the task in the second session, which also makes sense because for these participants, the first session and second session are all, almost identical. But the question was, what happened to the reward group participants? There's no activation at all. This is consistent with the behavior findings and indicate that there was indeed an undermining effect at the neural level. And importantly, this was actually represented in the reward network, especially stratum in the brain. One important implication of these findings are Sometimes these findings are taken as an evidence that intrinsic motivation is competitive with extrinsic rewards. But actually, one important thing is that both intrinsic motivation and extrinsic rewards are processed in the common reward network. So it's a little bit misleading to argue that they are competitive. They are processed in the same brain areas, but given the difference of the salience or some other properties, when both things are present, one works better than others. Let me talk about the last topic and the appreciation. Again, this is a common standard, standard reinforcing learning uh, 
framework with extrinsic incentives. For this system to work effectively, it's actually crucial that agents have an accurate estimate of the rewarding value when they are present with conditional stimuli. That is, it is very important that people have, a, agents have an accurate metacognitive judgment about ex expected extrinsic rewards value, expected rewards value of the extrinsic incentives. Previous study indicated that although there is some systematic bias, uh, people have a relatively accurate understanding of the expected reward value. But what about the knowledge acquisition process? Again, for this system work effect effectively, it's important that agent can actually have an accurate understanding of the rewarding value of knowledge acquisition. But the trouble is that there are so many things that the agent need to consider to estimate the expected rewarding value. Indeed, having a look at the big picture, you can also imagine that how difficult it is for people to make a prediction about how rewarding it would be to get the knowledge, to get the particular knowledge. Based on this conjecture, we can also imagine that there might be an underestimation of rewarding value in the case of knowledge acquisition. We tried to demonstrate this idea using a paradigm called meta-motivation paradigm, which we recently developed. In this paradigm, participants worked on a task and often a very boring task, such as flanker task for 30 minutes or delete is from 10 pages of takis. Actually, these are my papers. So participants are forced to read my papers and they are forced to read ease from my papers. And after this boring task, participants had to participants were asked to report their motivation. Or we also assessed their motivation using a behavioral task. This is a common motivation paradigm, but we added a tweak to this paradigm. That is, we also asked participants to make a prediction about their motivation before doing the task. Then by comparing these two motivations, then we can see whether the participants overestimated or underestimated their motivation. It turned out that we used many different tasks and it turned out that in many boring tasks, participants actually enjoyed boring tasks way more than they expected. That is, people thought that, oh, this task is going to be very boring but actually they found the task more enjoyable than they expected. I must add that the task was boring. So the actual intrinsic motivation rating when we use a self-reported equation is not that high, but still there was an underestimation of how much they can enjoy the task. That's the point. We also give rewards, extrinsic incentives to the task to see how this metacognitive judgment changed. And what we found is that participants actually overestimated the power of extrinsic rewards. So when we give rewards to participants, participants tended to, uh, thought that, tended to think that, oh, I'm gonna be motivated, but they were not so motivated as they expected. These results indicate that people would underestimate the power of intrinsic motivation, whereas people would overestimate the power of extrinsic motivation. Some people may wonder how we can define a boring task. So we did a kind of extreme experiment to further demonstrate the idea. In this experiment, uh, participants are put in a dark room for 20 minutes and were asked to do nothing. They were asked to put on earphone so they couldn't listen to anything. And of course, we you know, removed any electric devices from participants. So participants couldn't take any mobile phones. They were just asked to sit and think in a dark room. And after this 20 minute thinking period or sitting period, participants were asked to report their motivation for the past 20 minutes. And we also asked participants to make a prediction about how enjoyable this 20 minutes would be before doing this task. So this is a kind of duplication sensory duplication paradigm which just used more than 50 or 60 years ago. 
but we are interested in the metacognitive judgment about this sensory deprivation. What we found is that this, is, this turns out to be one of the most robust phenomena that I found in my career. Uh, you can do this experiment in your lab quite easily because you don't need anything other than the questionnaires, and you can easily replicate findings. But what we found is that people enjoy just waiting more than expected. That is, people thought that this, tax, this uh, waiting period is quite boring, but actually they enjoy the waiting period much more than they expected. What are the implications of metacognitive inaccuracy? When we take an information seeking behavior, the choice of information seeking behavior is based on the metacognitive judgment or rewarding value of this information seeking behavior. Which action makes me feel good? Which knowledge makes me feel good? But if this metacognitive judgment is wrong, then people should take a maladaptive, maladaptive action choice. As a result, people cannot regulate their behavior in an optimal manner. We tested this idea uh, by changing, modifying the previous task. That is, participants are put in a dark room again, but before doing this task, participants are given two choices. That is, participants can, in one choice, in one option, participants had to wait in a dark room for 20 minutes, like the previous experiments. But in the other option, participants were allowed to play with the internet. And they were asked, which option would you like to do in this experiment? As expected, most participants wanted to play with the internet, more than maybe 80%, I don't remember the exact number. Actually, were happy to take the internet option. But when we compared the actual enjoyment of these two options, there were no differences. This means that participants underestimated the potential enjoyment of waiting period and as a result, they tended to choose, choose, choose the internet, playing with the internet. But actually, this actually meant, um, this suggests that participants miss the opportunity to entertain themselves in a dark room for 20 minutes. So the current findings indicate that people have an inaccurate metacognitive judgment when it comes to intrinsic motivation and curious interest. And these findings also explain our over-reliance on rewards for self-motivation or motivating others. When you want to motivate other people, we tend to rely on extrinsic incentives. I'd be wondering why, but one potential explanation is that people tend to overestimate the value of extrinsic rewards to motivate other people. And people also tend to overestimate underestimate the value of intrinsic motivation to motivate other people or yourself. That's why people tend to rely on the strategies uh, that make use of extrinsic incentives. There are many motivational intervention studies in education, and in these studies, we tend to target students' psychological process, but to make a real change, we also need to target stakeholders' meta motivation belief. So I went through the basic framework with some empirical evidence. Um, this framework basically accommodates the two opposing meta theories of interest and curiosity. Also, at the beginning, I said that there are different research traditions, but using this framework, we can integrate these perspectives because this uh, framework speaks to how short-term information seeking behavior can be sustained over time. Research on curiosity tends to focus on short-term information seeking behavior. Research on interest focuses on the development of interest or how people's behavior can be sustained over a long time period. And research on trade curious interest are more interested in, in the stable personality trait of curious interest. And there has been a missing link between these three lines of research, but by using this framework, we can actually explain how these three different lines of research can be connected to each other. Future directions, um, I think I'm running out of time, so I, I just you know, skimmed these slides, but I have been focusing on 
knowledge acquisition as a source of intrinsic rewards. But this is not the only way how we actually experience enjoyment or rewarding feeling, internal rewarding feeling. And I've been recently working on several other social sources of intrinsic rewards, such as effort and challenge and social reinforcement learning. For example, in this challenge project, uh, we examined how challenge can be rewarding. Challenge and effort have been considered as a aversive in economics or decision-making literature, but sometimes people generate internal rewards for challenging situations. For example, George Malloy had a famous quote, why do you want to climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. And this indicates his genuine interest of um, going, going on the top of the Mount Everest. We did a behavior and ex ephemeral experiment to examine whether there's a kind of intrinsic rewarding value for challenge. And what we found is that when participants are rewarded, participants actually prefer the easy options, people avoid the challenge, but when they are not rewarded, then people show slight preference for challenge. And I wouldn't get into details, but using behavior experiments and brain imaging studies, we show that uh, the situation seems, the picture looks quite different when extrinsic rewards are available and when extrinsic rewards are not available. Another source of intrinsic rewards that I've been working on is a social uh, reinforcement learning. Sometimes we learn the enjoyment of a task by observing other people. That is, people should feel rewarding if they see others enjoying a task. And this is called social reinforcement learning. If this is one of the major sources of intrinsic motivation, we can also make an interesting prediction. For example, we can make a prediction that people's generation of intrinsic rewards for a task may spread through a social network. This is, can be called a social contagion motivation. For this purpose, we recruited students from a local school and scan these students. And we also assess the social network of these students and examine whether their motivation are similar between friends and their brain activation is similar between friends or not. When using questionnaire, questionnaires, we actually found the similarity between friends, especially in terms of grit and mindset belief, which is related to effort. But we also examine whether students' brain activation is similar between students, between friends, using resting state fMRI brain, uh, resting state brain imaging data. Unfortunately, my actual hypothesis was not supported. Uh, we just, what we did is that we analyzed the resting state brain network and we compare the similarity of the resting state connect connectivity matrix and we examine whether these two matrices are sim more similar between friends and non-friends, but we didn't find the evidence for the similarity between friends. We also actually collected task data and we are currently analyzing the data to see if this is also the case for the task data. So that's it. Um, thank you for listening for a long time. Sorry for going over the time, but uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. You didn't go over time because I know we, for this one, we allocate an hour and a half and people who need to leave in an hour will leave. But so this is perfect. I'm going to unmute everyone. Maybe I'll let Lizzie do this. Lizzie, do you want to unmute everyone and we can thank the speaker and take some questions? I'm having trouble finding that button. Unmute. Okay. I think people can manage also, but um, for those who can, we can thank the speaker. Thank you so much. You just moved during COVID from England to Germany, and I know you're setting up your lab and dual careers, and, and so thank you so much, and young children, so we really appreciate <laughs> this. Um, I, was this. I twisted your arm and really wanted to hear your updates, so thank you very much. Um, we have some questions, and I do as well, but I'm going to let other people ask questions. Let me start with um, Whit Tabor, who has a question here. Consistent with your comparison of time scales across the different lines of research on curiosity, 
I noticed that the snowball Matthew effect seems to take place over many different time scales. You mentioned processes that span periods of weeks of, or years. I suggest that the well-known aha effect is very similar. It also shows the snowballing profile and can take place over minutes, seconds, or milliseconds. Do you find this parallel plausible? And if so, why does the phenomena of snowballing take place over so many different time scales? It's, and in brackets, seems like the long-term cases don't fit neural sustained activation accounts, since surely sustained activation can't last that long. Is that a good question? Um, the basic point of the small snowball effect is that it depends on the knowledge st structure that one has. And when you are working on um, subject matter, which needs elaborate, you know, very sophisticated knowledge network, such as learning mathematics or learning science, then it should manifest over a long period of time because for this knowledge network to be complete, it would take time. Um, so, but when you're working on more limited uh, kind of things, such as trivia questions, magic tricks, and so on, then there's little room for this knowledge to be developed for a long period of time. Then the Matthew effect should manifest with, with a shorter period of time, but I cannot imagine that the interest in trivia questions would manifest over three or five years. So it depends on the type of things that you are learning that determine the type uh, that determines the time frame of math effect. That's my current explanation. Any other questions? I have a question in the meantime, if that's okay, Ko. Um, yeah. uh, great work. So much has happened over the past several years. You've uh, done great work. And, um, and as you know, I'm not in your field and don't actively do research in your field, but I find it very fascinating. But I always wonder with these things of the causal effects, and I know you do some kind of SEM and path analysis and trying to dissociate some of these, but for example, like this last experiment of the, um, so, and I feel like a lot of these concepts are very related that you kind of laid out in terms of curiosity and interest and trying to look at overlap and kind of dissociate those. But also I wonder, I, as a lay person, I always wonder the kind of cause and effect. So for example, for the last experiment, you talked about the social, uh, children's social network and how that was related to um, grit and mindset and, and um, is, so is it, or did you explore the causal relationship between this? Is it because friends who are similar brings them closer and they get yeah. closer? Like, I mean, it's the same thing as married couples and all that kind of stuff probably as well, but if you have any insight. Yeah, so it, it comes down, down to the design. So when two friends are similar, there are two possibilities. The first one is contagion. So if one of the friend is interested in something, this influenced the interest of the other friend. Another possibility is called homophily, that is, they became friends because they have the common interest. And to tease them apart, we need to use a longitudinal design. And for the social contagion effect of self reported questions, actually, we collected data from three to four time points. And so we were able to tease apart these two different effects of similarity between friends. Uh, for the for and the, that's why you call us, that's why you're saying social contagion because you were able to tease that apart. Yeah, but Got in it. terms of the brain imaging findings, we used cross-sectional data. Um, because of the drop, dropout rate, uh, we still have longitudinal data, but I'm not sure if the power is sufficient. But anyway, we didn't find similarity between friends. So there's no point of examining causal effect anyway. There's a possibility that positive and negative causal effects cancel each other out. But uh, given the little effect between friends, uh, I don't think, yeah, we are going to have more interesting things when we look at the longitudinal data. Why do you think you didn't find anything in the resting state? Or is it the measurement issue? Is it the, I don't know. What yeah, so resting state uh, brain activation 
is you know reflects so many things but when you think about a student put in the scanner of course they think about something they dream something <laughs> and the content of this you know free float thinking should be quite different between students so in a sense it makes sense that we didn't find any similarity in terms of listening state effect there was a paper uh, before we did a study uh, features published before we published this study showing that there was a similarity between friends uh, in response to video clips. So participants are put into the scanner and they watch the same video clip. And then there's a similarity between friends. And this actually makes sense as well, because when they watch the same movie, then their basic uh, flow of mind is constrained quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that two you know, similar friends actually think about a similar thing. They may even think about common experiences that they had uh, related to the video clip they are watching. And this might re have reflected, might, might have been reflected in the similarity of the task-based task -based brain activity in that paper. So I think it depends on the task. And Makes again, we think it, yeah, yeah, brain imaging data is just unconstrained. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, are you planning more experiments in this area? Yes, uh, I'm actually trying to do a um, manipulation of yeah, I, friendship. I'm to do, yeah, <laughs> in my study that try to manipulate social contagion in some way and that's examine that's the neural correlates underlying it. Manipulating social contagion seems better than manipulating their friendship. So that's <laughs> comforting yeah, to yeah. hear. Yeah, social reinforcement learning paradigm is, you know, an active topic in the field of additional neuroscience. And uh -huh. we can put this idea to the context of interest and curiosity. Great. We have a question from Rebecca Akapchak. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I should have checked the other day, but great talk. Thanks. Um, one of your last few slides, you mentioned an implication for targeting stakeholder meta-awareness, perhaps around miscalculations of reward value of activities like sitting quiet versus using internet that I didn't fully catch. Wondering if you can explain this implication further. Yeah, sorry, I was rushing and my explanation was not good at all. Sorry about this. So basically, just ask a question, why, you know, policymakers want to impose rewards on us? Um, I, when I was working, um, at the university, when I was working at the previous institution, there was a kind of grand target. And I didn't like the idea um, because I was intrinsically motivated to do research. And even without the grand target, I was happy to write grant proposals. And yeah. I, was, you know, yeah. But somehow stakeholders want to impose this kind of targets, uh, external rewards to motivate people. And my question is, why do people rely on extrinsic incentives such strongly? But this experiment uh, gives us some clue to this behavior. That is, uh, our experiments found that people tend to underestimate the value of intrinsic rewards, but people tend to overestimate the value of extrinsic rewards. When they are provided with rewards, then they tend to predict that, oh, I need to be very motivated for the task. But actually their motivation was not that great as that uh, in comparison to what they expected. And this indicates that people actually, and when people want to set a strategy to motivate other people or motivate themselves, of course, this strategy is based on their estimation of how effective this strategy would be. If the metacognitive uh, judgment is inaccurate, and if metacognitive judgment overestimate the motivating power of extrinsic rewards, of course, they tend to rely on extrinsic incentives because they believe that this is much more effective than let people do what they want. But our experiments show that uh, although people tend to think that uh, extrinsic rewards are quite effective, uh, it's not that effective in reality. And that's why there's a kind of discrepancy between what policymaker expects and, uh, and the actual effectiveness of these strategies. 
Uh, does that answer the question? Seems like she's nodding. Oh. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. Watching the political shenanigans in the U.S., I was wondering if uh, you thought of associating self-worth with uh, motivation because this is one of the things that is very um, prominent in uh, support of Trump and other bad decisions. Um, so the question is, an index for self-worth um, determining a response of um, reward. Thank you. Excellent talk. Yeah, thank you. That's also a great point because when we make a prediction of other people, this prediction is based on your own knowledge and your you know, history of learning. Your history is, uh, is the most important thing. Uh, people's decision or strategies is based on their own history of learning. And importantly, as I But people develop the knowledge quite differently because of this self-boosting effect. Self-worth is an important, actually, uh, example of this thought. People form their own self-esteem in their own manner. And there are many different mechanisms that make it possible, but this self-boosting effect should be one of the mechanisms underlying it. And the important implication is that with this mechanism, we can expect that there are huge individual differences of the way, the type of self-esteem people form. This means that people have self-esteem, everyone has self-esteem, but they have, they have their self-esteem in their own manner. Um, but policy makers make decisions based on their own self-esteem, but because of the huge individual differences of this self-esteem, this strategy should not be effective for everyone. So that's why there are sometimes huge differences or discrepancy between what the policy makers want to achieve and what the actual effectiveness is. Thank you. Other questions? Can I ask one last question? I know everyone who needs to leave, please do leave. So I don't feel too bad. And if there's no questions, I want to ask a little more. But, um, and you pro probably alluded to this in a kind of, I kind of went over my head, but I always get confused with intrinsic versus in extrinsic motivation and um, how the, the it's, whether it's, well, I'm, so be for a naive person, I feel like people often use it as a dichotomy. It seems like it's more of a continuum and I often have a hard time when, for example, someone asks, is this extrinsically motivating a child or intrinsically motivating a child? For example, stickers or other things. And, and it's probably because of my lack of knowledge, but if you can kind of simply explain where you draw the line, that would be very helpful. Yeah. That was the starting point of this framework, actually. So it's not the dichotomy, and it's not the continuum either, in my mind. Um, there's a basic principle, there's a reward learning. Mm -hmm. And people say regulate behavior based on this reward learning. But you know, what serves as reward can be different. And sometimes food works as a reward. Sometimes knowledge works as a reward. Sometimes challenge or effort serves as a reward social recognition serves as a reward. And each reward is different. It, all of the rewards are the same in that they work, they actually function in the common scheme of reward learning. But of course, the specific features of each type of reward are different. Again, for extrinsic incentives, for example, uh, it's consumed and it's satiated. So it doesn't have a long sustainability. But when it comes to knowledge acquisition, uh, because knowledge is integrated into our knowledge base uh, self scheme, uh, there's a sustainability. This is just two examples of different types of reward, uh, which result in different behavior within the same reward learning framework. 
Yes, um, great. When, when I think about sort of concrete examples, then can one, in a very tricky situation, can one um, type of, so if you take one thing, I'm just gonna take M&M &M and it's not a very good, it's not a good example at all, but can some kind of reward can never be in both buckets? Meaning, there's, there's a reception issue, you know, no, there's a connection issue, so I just couldn't. Yeah, I'm just curious. So, I'm probably asking a very dumb question, but can the um, can one kind of one tangible example of a reward serve as another kind of reward or motivation motivator um, in different situations and different people? Is that what you're saying, also, or is that even a possibility? Um, so. I feel like I'm not understanding the fundamental kind of... There's individual differences and there's a contextual dependency. Yeah, of course, for sure. But again, it's important to think about what reward we are talking about. And contextual dependency exists, but it depends on what... And, but we also need to think about the type of reward. When it comes to knowledge acquisition, for example, uh, the type of topic is crucial. Because again, when it comes to mathematics, there's a rich knowledge network that one needs to acquire mm -hmm. to, yeah. But when it comes to trivia questions or some miscellaneous things, then there's no little sustainability about right. this. And this kind of contextual factor makes a big difference. Right. Um, but for extrinsic rewards, sometimes, yeah, this, for extrinsic rewards, this kind of contextual factor uh, doesn't make sense because it's about water or foods and there's no knowledge involved in this process. Um, right, except for the value would differ, of course, between different people or how yeah. much they assign the value. Yeah. Um, so just a concrete, so example, if you give a sticker to your daughter because they went, she went to the potty properly or something like that, is that, does that count as an extrinsic reward or just a very tangible kind of a, question. So it, it's just a reward. Of course, we can label this as an extrinsic reward. And with this reward, because there's no knowledge component in it, it's not sustainable. But at the same time, for example, this is, I, I'm talking a slightly different thing, but at the same time, this would be a good idea to start up the process of uh, knowledge acquisition process. Because when you give food to a kid uh, for doing for mastering something, then it's an uh, extrinsic reward. But the children also felt positive about mastering the materials. Uh, so this is a mixture of extrinsic and intrinsic reward. But by giving these extrinsic rewards, uh, you may be able to make kids more aware of these positive feelings about acquiring knowledge. Yeah. And this may help people actually build up their intrinsic motivation over time. So I-, I That makes sense. Yes, sometimes I'm asked whether it's a good idea to give rewards or not. And my answer is, um, especially at the initial stage, actually it helps. Because yep. I remember some I of your other research related to that as well, like for boring materials versus interesting, intrinsically, in, innately interesting, kind of inherently interesting materials. But um, it makes a difference, it seems like. So thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you so much, Ko, and it was Thank great to get an time. update of, for your, of your amazing work. Thank you very much, and happy holidays, everyone. And we'll see you next year, but thank you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Bye, Ko. Bye.